name is Mary Sam. I'm the Director of Equity and Inclusion here at Central Lakes College. And on behalf of Central Lakes College and President here at Sharon Lane, I'd like to welcome everybody to CLC. And I'd like to uh, do a special shout out to my relatives living from the Mille Lacs community, Omania High School students. Yay! It's always great to see younger, younger people here, right? So in typical Ojibwe tradition, um, we're going to start today's program with a welcome song sung by a recent uh, Central Lakes College graduate, another relative, Arlen Sam. Miigwech, Ireland. Miigwech means thank you. I'd also like to welcome students from Nyashing School. <laughs> Central Lakes College mission and values speak to building futures, honoring diversity, encouraging and supporting cultural enrichment, civic responsibility, and community development. Our diversity plan here at Central Lakes College in the Minnesota State System challenges us and challenges us to teach our students and each other about learning and thinking and believing and feeling globally and preparing our students for the world around us. Each year, Central Lakes College hosts the Native American Heritage Month programs, activities, speakers. Last year, we even hosted our first powwow after a 25-year reprieve. Please know we're going to do that again. This month, we were honored to have gifted poet, author, artist, Cheryl Minima here on campus a couple of weeks ago. I recognize some folks in the audience who attended that um, sweet, her nickname is Sweetie if you didn't know that, that sweet presentation. It was just really uh, touching and, and a wonderful presentation. Today it's our honor to have human civil rights, environmental rights activist Winona LaDuke in our presence here today. Winona LaDuke also ran on the Green Party ticket with Ralph Nader as vice president, for vice president of the United States two different times. And I saw that somebody had a Winona LaDuke Nader sign in the audience back there too. How cool was that, right? <laughs> I've been in my role here at Central Lakes College the last, for the last six years. And for the last six years, folks have tapped me on the shoulder. Both our students, our employees in the community saying, when are you going to get Winona here? It's taken about six years, and we know each other pretty well, right, don't we? 
um, but it's taken six years and we're really glad that you're here. Winona has a long history of protecting indigenous rights, human rights, and envir environmental rights. Winona is an author, a teacher, and an international, not just national, but an international force for change. She's the founder and executive director of Honor the Earth program organization, and again has run for vice president. She'll speak to us for 20, 30 minutes, and then she's going to open it up to, uh, to questions. She'll share a little bit about her history as a change agent, the challenges, the opportunities, and the need to come together to honor the Earth, the very organization that, that she is the director of. Again, it's our honor and privilege to welcome Honor Winona LaDuke. I mean, wait, hold on a second here. How did I do this again? <laughs> the arrow piece. This one? I'm trying to get to the beginning. There. Thank you. I'm going to just do this one here. I'm, as you could tell, I'm, uh, oh. Wow, that's really cool. Don't leave me. Can, is this work? Is this what I'm using? That works. Okay. If you pull the trigger. If I pull the trigger. <laughs> no wonder. Okay. No, it's like, wow, a little bit beyond me. I need an indoor mugging a duck. I go get to Magus, Vini Sequay to go, Makwendo Dam, Gavavani Kagish, Kanaginning, and Dunjavami Gwitch. Thanks very much for uh, honor being here with you today. I'm really glad uh, folks turned out. I want to make a couple quick announcements. Where'd that. Where'd that um, Notepad go. Okay, so if people are interested in more information, particularly on some of the pipeline battles in Minnesota or on Standing Rock, that's, um, that's a mailing list for Honor the Earth. I'm just going to put you on an email list, but just uh, let me know. That's going around. I just said it before I went too far, but super honored to be here with you today. This is where I live, uh, Round Lake over on the White Earth Reservation. And, um, you know, I'm like a lot of you. I, ha you know, I think we got a pretty good gig here. And this is there, this is, uh, you know, I've, we, there's very few places in the water that you can still drink, in the world that you can still drink the water from a lake. There's very few places in the world that you can get something as great as wild rice from a lake and sugar from a tree. We have a pretty, you know, the creator gave us a wonderful place to live. We have all come to live here. You know, I am very proud to be, you know, from this territory. Hey, this is moving on its own. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's very traumatic. It's okay. It's okay. It could move that far on its own. You just press it once. Just press it once. Oh, I am so last millennium. Um, but, uh, you know, that is the privilege of being the people who are here now and being Anishinaabe. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what is going on in the broader world and what it means from here. I'm an economist by training. I spent a lot of time in school, and, and I'm really interested in, in who's going to control our future, uh, what our water is going to be like, what our education system is going to be like, what our, where our food's going to come from, where our energy is going to come from. Not this year, but I'm interested in what it's going to be like 50 years from now, too. You know, and those are really, really important questions. All you young people, those are questions that you know we're going to need to grapple with, and we're going to need to make those decisions. And my feeling is, is that. You know, it is not something uh, that you want someone else to, to make those decisions. You're probably going to want to work on that yourselves. And so a lot of us, you know, that is, that is what we're thinking. This is uh, Big Rice Lake up on our reservation here a couple years ago. Um, you know, really a grateful, grateful for the harvest. And this is a little bit of what got me into these battles on the pipelines. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But um, see, now it did that on its own. I'm not going to touch it. <laughs> um, I'll stand here. Watch. <laughs> um, you know, I am. Um, uh, you know, I worked a lot on the rice harvest. We worked really hard to to keep our wild rice from getting genetically engineered. Do some of you remember this battle here a few years ago? They wanted to do that in the state of Minnesota, and uh, you know, we fought that off. And I feel like that's a pretty good gift, and I'd like to keep that. So what happened was, is about four years ago, the Enbridge Company announced this pipeline. Uh, known um, this as a sandpiper. Do you guys all remember this pipeline? Yeah. 
640,000 barrel a day tar, uh, at that point of a fracked oil pipeline. And it was going to head right through our rice beds. You know, and I, I just thought that's wrong. And we need to stop that. You know, and I'm just going to be honest, as I'm not opposed to pipelines. I'm like a first world infrastructure girl. I think infrastructure is important, but I want pipelines for people, not for oil companies. I like water and sewer lines. I think those are great. You know, I'm worried about the fact that our country has a D in infrastructure. You know, we have a D in infrastructure. We're like first world country, but we have like gas mains exploding, places like Duluth kind of crumbling in a deluge, right? We all saw that, bridges falling down. So what I want is for us to put people to work doing infrastructure that means something for us and is good for us over the long haul. I'm all for it. But you know, I started hearing about these pipelines. I said, that's not a good idea, you know? So I worked with my tribe and our community you know, I, I kind of wandered. A lot of you were at the hearings. I've seen a bunch of you. You know, we went to pretty much every regulatory hearing we could on those Enbridge proposals, and we fought them for four years. Y'all remember this, right? It was very hard, and the state didn't treat us very good, you know, in that process. As tribal people, you know, the tribal governments were disregarded. The state, you know, Minnesota Public Utilities Commission said they didn't have to consult with tribes on that. And they also disregarded a lot of the testimony and treated the citizens very poorly. It was, I felt like, a really unfair process. But in the, in the process of four years of battling them, y'all noticed that we won. Did y'all notice that? Yeah. You know, four years later, in August of this year, you know, after a four-year battle, Enbridge announced that it was no longer going to pursue this pipeline, you know, which I thought was good. You know, but I was super, I was disheartened because I learned that then, instead of that, they decided to go, to, they bought one-third of this pipeline known as, known as the Dakota Access Pipeline. And you all been listening to seeing what's going on out there in North Dakota, right? You know, and, and what I want to say about that is, you know, I'm a, you know, you guys see me, I'm a pretty nice person, I'm pretty reasonable. But, you know, North Dakota has had a long history of not treating Native people well. You know, and I think we have to say that. There's a lot of racism towards Native people in North Dakota. You know, even like the people, they had like all, a lot of their land, even the Army Corps affected our land here. But in North Dakota, those diversion projects took 200,000 acres out of Standing Rock. They flooded them. They put that community underwater. They took, you know, 75% of the animals and 95% of the trees. You know, how's that going to work out for people? You understand what I'm saying? It's like a lot of stuff happened like that for a long time in North Dakota, long time. And so, you know, but I was super alarmed when I seen what was going on out there. And you guys, some of you have been watching this on Facebook and in the media, and it's even being covered in the national media now. But, um, you know, what happened is this, co this company called... Um, Energy Transfer Partners, they didn't go through the same process that, you know, we've tried to force Enbridge into here. What they did is they, had, they made the pipeline, it's a, you know, a 1,300-mile pipeline. They make it into a bunch of small pieces, and they review each piece in, you know, different times. It's called the nationwide permitting process. And so they made it look like little pipelines, and then they get it through like that. And, and it's not, it wasn't true, because it's one big line. You all know this stuff, some of it, right? And then the other thing they did is initially that pipeline was proposed to go just north of the city of Bismarck, which is about 95% white. And in order to not compromise the water supply of the city of Bismarck, they put it north of Standing Rock <laughs> Reservation, you know, which isn't fair. It's not fair to do that to people, you know. And uh, then they started pushing, you know, really aggressive. And, um, you know, they went through some, some of a lot of... Uh, you know, people's graves and a lot of sacred sites just in this aggressive push. So what's going on out in North Dakota is what shouldn't happen. You know, I'm like the rest of you. I, I didn't sign up to live in El Salvador or Honduras. I signed up to live here. You know, so what I don't want to see is my people getting hit. You know, and, and the thing about it is, is that, you know, this is really the epicenter of the, of the environmental justice battles for Native people right now. It's right there in North Dakota. Because what these people want is what these people want is, is clean water. You know, these people are getting beat up over their interest to protect clean water. And the company that, is, that wants to pollute the water is the company that has 1,300 policemen with it, right? Including those that came from Hennepin County. You know, and this woman was uh, sprayed, and, um, you know, she's one of the main people that was sprayed out there. This was early on. Um, this is them getting sprayed when they're in the water um, by all those cops. You know, it's like really wrong what how they treat those people. Um, this is this um, called an MRAP. Um, you know, I had asked someone what that was because I saw it when I was out there. I said, what's that big thing? You know, that's called an MRAP. That's called a mine-resistant armored personnel carrier. 
you know, mine resistant, mine as in landmines. To the best of my knowledge, there are no landmines in North Dakota, right? You know, but they took that out there. It's pretty much like a war party to go. You could take down a village with that thing, you know? So super over-militarized behavior. The thing behind it is called a long-range acoustic device. It's got a sound blaster that uh, busts your eardrums when they set, let off that, the sounds, you know? And, and um, you know, that's what they're doing to these people out there. And um, so, so far, there's uh, 480 people that have been arrested. And for those of you who have been watching it, you know, it's not just that they get arrested, you know, because, you know, I've engaged, I've been arrested once, you know, um, I was arrested, uh, I tied myself to the front of a phone book factory in L.A. because uh, I didn't think an 800-year-old tree should be a phone book. You know what I'm saying? And so it's like, I, but I tied myself next to a rich lady and had a bunch of lawyers. It was all right, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, I was, I was okay. I was actually, when I was running for vice president, you know, they took my pictures. I was like, hi, <laughs> running, running now. Um, but, um, you know, having said that, um, I don't really want to have, like, that's, I want civil society that works. I want a system that works. I don't want this, you know. And when those people were arrested, I was talking to my friend, um, well, his name is Ron, his horse thunder. And he used to be president of the tribal college out there, Sitting Bull Tribal College. He's an elder native man. And uh, he is president of the tribal college, but I think he is also chairman, tribal chairman. The tribal chairman was even arrested out there. And, and this guy too, they're all strip searched. Misdemeanor charges, strip searched everybody. You know, and then uh, a lot of them, um, you know, um, I, I think, well, Ron, his horse thunder, he and his wife, they're in their 60s, were put in a dog kennel overnight for nine hours. I was like, wow. He's like, well, you know, we're tough. But like, I think that's just wrong. I think that whole thing's wrong. It's inhumane and it's a violation of, you know, a lot of international laws and it's not right. But um, that's what's going on out there. And, um, you know, I'm talking about this. This is uh, this weekend on Saturday on the bridge. And uh, this is what it looked like if you were on the line. And I think that some of you know that there was a young woman out there who was bringing water out there. This is her name. And they, they launched um, a, a concussion grenade, which I don't really understand. But from what I understand from my partner, that's something like if you want to, like there's a, um, somebody holed up in a bank and he's the one in there, you throw that concussion grenade and it makes a big boom, right? But it's like inside a building. I'm really not up on like all the weaponry. But they threw that in that crowd, and this woman's arm, it's not clear. I think she, she lost her arm. You know, she lost her arm, right? Yeah, and, and you know, she's a 21-year-old woman. And I don't think that's right. I don't think that's right. You know, and, and so what I'm trying to, trying to point out is, is that, you know, we're, I think we have a moral and civil crisis in this country. If a corporation has more rights than people, and if the rights of that corporation to pollute supersede the rights of people to protect their water. And the reason I'm telling you this story is because the Enbridge company bought one third of that pipeline. And this is a pipeline that they are proposing to use instead of the sandpiper. It's a 570,000 barrel a day pipeline. That's what the Dakota Access Pipeline is. And Enbridge bought one third of it. And that company, Enbridge, is the same company that wants to come here and put in line three now. And I feel that they should be liable for the behavior in North Dakota that they don't get to pretend that that was not done with their interests in mind, and that this is not going to happen here. This is not going to happen here. They are not going to get everything they want, and they are not going to blow off our arms on their way to try to get what they want. You know, I'm saying this is serious, and this is not an Indian person. This is a woman from upstate New York who had her arm blown off. So uh, this is some of our campaign a couple years ago. This is me and my, I think she looks really tough, my friend Jill Ninham. Doesn't she look tough there? She's from Oneida. I think she was looking tough. But we, we, we rented a bunch of these signs um, um, before, and, you know, we're about to do something new. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But, you know, just to give you a little perspective, I was asked to, you know, talk. You know, like I said, I'm an economist. I just like to live in this good life. And I spend a lot of my life fighting what I call stupid projects. I think they're stupid if they spend a lot of money and they don't benefit people. You know, and I've seen a lot of bad ones in my life. I've seen big dam projects that would flood out whole communities, and I've seen big strip mines. And I've seen a lot of these projects get stopped. They get stopped. Because usually the projects are very, very expensive. And, um, you know, it costs a lot of money to do a lot of this stuff. So, you know, I spend a lot of my time doing it because I'd like to see good things happen to our people. But, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, 
My organization, Honor the Earth, has three people out there in Standing Rock right now, and I have nieces and nephews who've been arrested and charged with felonies. Um, although most people had their felony charges dismissed out there this last week, uh, about a week and a half ago. But, uh, you know, we don't want to be like that. We don't want to be that because we're, we're, we're good people here. And I'm, I'm going to ask the, the northern Minnesota people to all work together to say, you know, this isn't right to have happen here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, I just thought he's cute. <laughs> anyway, isn't he cute? You know, I, I, anyway. Um, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a bigger picture of where we're at. Um, and now it's not going nowhere, buddy. <laughs> um, oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, you know, for I'm I'm not I'm going to brush over some of this, but you know, basically, I want to say, you know, I spent my whole life in the fossil fuel era. You know, I'm 57 years old. I spent my whole life, I, I, I had pretty good time. You know, I uh, drove around a lot. I consumed half the world's known oil supplies. I'm right there. You all were with me, right? I mean, come on. That's right. You know, we've all done this. And so basically what I'm after, that we all need to be after, is an elegant transition out. An elegant transition. I'm saying time to move on. Thank you. That's enough dinosaurs. So we'll leave the rest. We'll move on. So that's what I want to talk about. But, you know... The reasons are clear because there's huge human rights violations going on now. You know, I mean, I don't know if any of you have addicts in your family. I have some addicts in my family, and I don't know if you ever notice addicts are kind of a drag, you know? I mean, I'll just be honest. My one addiction is coffee. Like, you, you know, it's, I'm not giving it up, okay? We're just sticking with it, you know? That's my, my one, I'm good. You know, but people, uh, you know, a lot of people who have addictive behavior, they end up doing really bad stuff. You know, and they, they rationalize it, you know. They say, you know, well, she made me do that, or, you know, you made me do that, or, you know. Uh, and, and to get their fix, they do more of our crazy stuff a lot of times. Sometimes they cheat, sometimes they lie, sometimes they steal, you know. And that's kind of what's happening to us. And we're at this point where we kind of have combusted ourselves to the edge of oblivion. And what I mean by that is our temperatures are going up, I know that Donald Trump didn't get these notes, but, you know, I can't help it. You know, the guy's not that smart, so <laughs> we are more enlightened. Um, this is, uh, it's doing the not going. Can you, like, make it? Oh, there. <laughs> just stay right there, buddy. Thanks. So. Isn't he great? He just, like, he moves and then everything happens. It's great. I really appreciate that. So the ice is melting. This is a native village in Alaska called Kivalina. It's fallen in the ocean. Uh, you know, this is what climate change looks like. They say that we're going to be spending uh, in three years 20% of world GDP, GDP on climate-related uh, disasters. That's a lot of bucks, you know. And I don't know who's paying for that. You know, maybe Trump will pay for that. I don't know. But you see what I'm saying is it's like Brainerd doesn't have, like Duluth didn't have the money for their flood. You know what I'm saying is the more disasters we have, the more costly it's going to be, and we're not set up for that. So what we want to do, and, and what's going on today is a, is a result of 100 years ago what was combusted. You know what I'm saying? You know, and I had a lovely, a lovely fall. Do you all have a lovely fall? But we all know that was weird, right? It's like super weird. We're northerners. I'm like, where's my snow? You know? And so, you know, what we do now is going to be really important. So climate change is a part of the issue. This is uh, what happens with CO2. It goes mostly, um, you know, it goes mostly into the water. And uh, I don't know what the CO2 is in the lakes here. Actually, I never really thought about the acidification of the lakes, but this is what uh, your ocean looks like on acid. You know, and that's what's going on. You know, so all them fish and chips and, you know what I'm saying, those fish sticks, we ain't going to have those if we keep this up. There's like a 20%, 25% drop in the North Pacific fishing, you know. That's what's going on. So this is not like a native issue. These are world issues, you know? And we have a big part of them. Um, and our part is these pipelines, you know, because we don't have any fossil fuels here, but what we have is lines that want to cross us. And so, you know, I was talking a little bit before about how we're, you know, we consumed all this oil. So we did it. I was there. I partied. I had a good time. And now I want is, I basically want an electric car. That's what I'm after. Because this is what happens when you get kind of run out of stuff. You get kind of extreme. 
And so extreme behavior is like blowing off the top of 500 mountains in Appalachia. And extreme behavior is when you drill 20,000 feet under the ocean and you hope that's going to work out for you. You know what I mean? You know, like they're like, we could do it, we could do it. And I'm like, yeah, you could do it. And then you get that deep water horizon. Y'all remember that? You know, that like just every day I would cry when I, you know, would see that it's still going, you know? Because they, they are so smart, but, you know, your technology is not as smart as the world that we live in, you know? And, uh, and then this is what fracking looks like, you know? And so what I also want to say is, is that they're trying to justify these pipelines based on something that is egregious. It's egregious. What does that mean? It means, like, it take, every four years you got to put in a new well. And so they put 602 chemicals down, explode the bedrock of Mother Earth, and then Western North Dakota has widespread groundwater contamination right now. So I'm like, how's that working out for you, North Dakota? And then you guys been seeing these um, earthquakes in, in, in Oklahoma, right? The Oklahoma earthquakes, which never had earthquakes. So I'm just wondering, like my personal, like I'm waiting for someone to figure it out. But like, you remember all those nuclear warheads in North Dakota? Like I'm wondering how the nuclear warhead earthquake thing's going to work out, right? You understand what I'm saying? Like I'm a little worried about North Dakota. So I'm saying, I've been like saying, I hope it works out for you in North Dakota all these times. And now I'm really like hoping it works out, you know, because the nuclear weapon warhead earthquake thing don't sound good, right? You know, maybe, maybe that they're all earthquake proof, but, you know, I don't trust any of them. At this point, I don't trust any of them, you know? I, you know, and this is how much oil there is. But what I want to say is, is that that pipeline that they're looking at, this is, we call it the Dakota Excess Pipeline. They call it the Dakota Access. We call it the Dakota Excess. And why? It's pretty simple in the math. This is the story. The average well lasts four years. This is the average well. And then it busts out. You see that? You know, like it's at the bottom of the barrel already. You all follow me? I'm trying to be kind of quick because I want to, you know. Okay, so that's what it looks like out there. And so there's an 85% drop in drilling right now in the Bakken. Now, those of you, you know, you know those, they, we call them the bomb trains. You know what I'm talking about? The big trains that go by all full of black oil tankers. Did you notice there's less of them now than there were a year ago and a year before? That's because the Bakken is busted. That means that they're just 85% drop in drilling. They're not really a lot of drilling in the Bakken because the price is Saudi oil, right? Without getting too complicated on you. But you all know this, right? The Saudis, you know, I love the Saudis. Every day I thank the Saudis. You know, because it's helping our environment here, you know, that they're not drilling over here. Because all this stuff they're trying to do in, in North Dakota and in the tar sands, all that stuff, all of that stuff is, is super based on cheap, uh, you know, that they got to be able to do it. And it costs 60 bucks a barrel to get this oil out. So what I'm saying is, is that right now, it's a little math problem. I was talking to you guys, my friends from Oanami, about trivia contests. Okay. 900,000 barrels a day is coming out of the Bakken right now, right? Oil. It's coming either out by pipeline or rail car. In, 20, in 2019, North Dakota commissioner, this guy is named Lynn Helms. He's kind of like my arch nemesis. Lynn Helm says that there's going to be 900,000 barrels a day of oil coming out of the Bakken in, in 2019. So that's pretty much like this, right? Y'all get that? There's 900,000 barrels a day, and that's already going out. On a train, one of them bomb trains are going out on a present pipeline, right? So the question is, why do they need a 570,000 barrel a day pipeline? That's how much this pipeline is. And why are they, you know, basically on the edge of killing people to get that pipeline in? You understand what I'm saying? That's why we call it the Dakota Excess Pipeline. There's like no reason. It's so much about hate. It's so much about we can do this. It's so much about, you know, entitlement. It's so much about, you know, this is ours. You know, and it is most, you know, to be honest, it is, it is quite likely about oil that might be coming from Canada instead. You know, we defeated the Keystone XL, but I believe that this is Keystone Light. You know, that's what I think they're going to do because there's no oil for that pipeline. So to me, like all this math and all this stuff and all this need, we're about to face it here in Minnesota with line three. You know, that they say they need that oil. They need that oil. You know, I no longer believe them. I no longer believe them. We spent four years fighting Enbridge on the Sandpiper line. And uh, then what happened is, is that, you know, they announced that, that they're going to put in that other line in North Dakota. And so I was at a meeting with Enbridge. 
You know, I said, uh, hey, you guys, I feel like you cheated on me. I said, for four years, you told me you had to have this, that we were your one and only place you could put a pipeline. For four years, they told everybody in Minnesota it was an essential route, core route. I said, then you drop us and go to North Dakota. I said, I feel like you cheat on me, you know? But what I'm saying is, it's like, you know, I don't trust these guys. I don't trust these guys at all. So this is what we're looking at here. Um, you know, I, I, there's a piece of literature that uh, went around. Did you all get your little line three literature? You know, I said, I, like, I've been in North Dakota quite a bit, out there to Standing Rock. I'm working with the Standing Rock tribal government and, and the groups on the ground there, you know, to oppose the line. But I also want, I'm working with them to say that not only do they not need a pipeline, but what those guys need is justice. What they need is justice. So I'm going to just tell you, like, what I'm thinking on this. So we did some math. We're super mathy over at Honor the Earth. You guys saw math equations for you. But just say you had $3.9 billion. Just say you had $3.9 billion and you were using that to shove a pipeline down someone's throat, right? What could $3.9 billion buy? You know, that's a lot of bucks, right? You know? So $3.9 billion would buy you about uh, 164,000 solar panels for houses, five kilowatts each. You know what I'm saying? Like you could solarize a bunch of North Dakota with that, right? That's not bad, right? And then plus you could get 323 two megawatt wind turbines, right? So what I'm saying is it's like, you know, if you're an economist, you're looking at how you spend your money. And I'm like, that's not energy independence, what you're trying to do, that's stupid, right? I'm like, let's just do this other thing. You know, let's have wind and solar. Cause you know, we all know North Dakota's super windy, right? You know, and I mean, and even I'm driving back and forth out there, and I swear, I swear, I see more wind turbine parts moving out there than oil. I'm like, what you doing, North Dakota? Doing dumb, you know? So what I'm saying is, is that that's the same thing here. That's the same thing here. These are your pipelines. You know, we already have this across the north, is that uh, across basically Highway 2, you know, crossing uh, part of Red Lake, but Leech Lake and Fond du Lac reservations are six pipelines six pipelines. They're all super old. They're built like in the 1960s, right? You know, 1960s is great if you're me, not great if you're a pipeline, right? You know what I'm saying? It's just like 50-year-old pipeline carrying oil is a little bit iffy, right? Y'all follow me on this? And so they got six. I never paid no attention to them because I was like, well, pipelines, you know, that's not really a problem. They're a problem when they start leaking. And now they're a super big problem because they, they want new, a new route, and it adds more carbon to the environment. So they got six lines that are old, and then there's this new line, which is that, that lower line. That was the proposed sandpiper route, right? And a lot of you went to the hearings, and you know that that goes through, like, the best, best, you know, ricing areas by our rice areas, by over by Sandy Lake Watershed. Mille Lacs is super heavily affected by this. You know, all us Ojibwe people affected by it, but it's not just us because this is the place where our, our most pristine lakes are in northern Minnesota. These are the ones that outside of the boundary waters have the most life in them, you know? And the fact is, is that, you know, I went to every hearing and they always say pipelines don't leak. Well, I was reading this article in my little geeky self, Trudy Bell, former editor of Scientific American, does all these studies of like all the pipeline data, looks at everything says 57% chance of catastrophic leak. 57% chance, you know? So I'm not, I'm not doing that risk. I'm not doing that risk. They had a pipeline, you know, a pipeline leak about every week. Y'all been watching that stuff, right? You know, and here in northern Minnesota, they got a line, this line three. Line three, they want to abandon it because it's so leaky. They want to abandon it because it's so leaky. And that one they want to abandon and they want to leave the liability to us. And that's wrong. I, you know, I raised six kids, and I just hang out with my mother, and she reminded me one more time, got to clean up your old mess before you make a new mess, right? Got to clean up your old mess before you make a new mess. So what we want Enbridge to do is to clean up their old mess. You know, their line three has uh, uh, 1,400 structural anomalies in it. It should be retired. It should be retired. I don't think they should bring it back at all, but in the meantime, they should clean it up because it's basically a super fun site all along the highway. And they shouldn't get a new line. You should have to clean up your old mess because it's way cheaper for a company, super cheap, to throw pipe compared to clean up a mess and have to put pipe it in the same place, you know? 
And they said, oh, we can't do that. They had meetings with all those guys. I said, oh, we can't do that. I said, yes, you can. If you can trench a pipe in in a city, you could trench a pipe in on Highway 2. You know, clean up your mess. Clean up your mess. So that's what this literature is about. And I'm hoping some people, make sure you sign up if you want more information. But we need to really make sure people are informed. And that, to be honest, your, your county commissioners, your county commissioners and your state representatives need to find some courage. Because this is liability that is passed on to everyone here. You know? We have no reason to take liability for a Canadian oil company. We have no reason to. They need to be liable for their own mess, and we, need, we want a full cleanup and environmental assessment of line three in, in place before there is any discussion about any new lines. They need to clean up their old mess. And so that's what I'm saying is, is like, this is the voice of reason. This is the voice of reason. I know that other people think that they are the voice of reason, but I'm telling you that's reasonable. Okay, this is the future. I'm just gonna flip through. This is, um, you know what I'm saying is, is that in our prophecies as Anishinaabeg people, and all you young students at Nayashing and Anamia School, you heard these things before. Your, your older people and people like me would talk about, our prophets talked about that we would have a choice between two paths in the time of the seventh fire. And in the time of the seventh fire, we have a choice between two paths. And they said one was well-worn, but scorched. See, look at that. And, and one is not well-worn, but it's green. And it'd be our choice upon which path to embark. And what I'm telling you is that this is what the future looks like. I worked on this project. I helped raise the money for it. This is a, a Diné College in Shiprock, New Mexico. It's all solar, you know? No reason, no reason. And we use pollution credit money from uh, Southern California Edison. We do that, so, you know? You just, and, and you young people, you know, when you go to school, get some skills that you can do all this stuff, you know, because it's, it, it's all doable. You know, even with Trump, this is still money that needs to be moved around in the economy. There's a lot of things to do. This is wind generation, good potential. Those guys need to have wind turbines, not pipelines. That's what I said, you know, if you want the future. And then we need to get efficient. You know, we need to get efficient. So, you know, just this here is like a super geeky map or chart, but basically what you need to know is that between when they generate the power or get it out of the ground, whether it's like way over in Beulah, North Dakota with those coal plants that feed into the Minn Kota system or the 80-year-old coal plant up there on the IR range, they're super inefficient. You know what I'm saying? They're like old, creaky things, right? So between the point that they make them and the point that we plug in right here or we run our this thing here, 50... 57% of the power is wasted. So people say you can't meet present energy demand with renewable energy. And I always say, why would you want to? Why would you want to waste 57% of your energy? You know, what you want to do is, is the cool thing. You know, so I was reading um, a, my, my, a magazine that comes from my college, Harvard, and I was reading it, and there's this woman in there, and she was talking about um, the difference between a... Uh, combustion engine and an electric engine in our car, right? So my car, I drive a big pickup truck, my car, for every six gallons of gas you put in there, only one gallon actually powers your car because a combustion engine is super inefficient. It's super inefficient. Now an electric engine, you know what, how much how efficient that is? It's 65% efficient, like a Tesla, right? So what I'm saying is, is that we have the ability and the technology to move. Those things need to happen at a scale, and they need to happen, you know, in each of our houses. So this is uh, kind of the future. This is a film. Any of you guys see this film called The Seventh Fire? So this is a film about the village I live closest to, Pine Point, on the reservation. You know, I don't want to, I don't really care for the film, but it's this moment in time about how rough it is in our village. You know, and there's a lot of drug dealers and a lot of things, you know. So I feel like that I, I, I'm working in this and I live there. And you guys hung out with me. I'm super privileged, obviously. I get to hang out with you. But I live here. My grandkids live here. And I didn't want us to be this. So we decided we're going to try to make a change in our village. And so I decided that instead of being the destination place for buying your meth, we should be the destination place for art. So this is what we started. Um, we got six of them up. We did some solar. This is solar thermal on the houses in P-Town. My goal is to make our community something we're proud of. And then also, these solar thermal panels, these were made by these guys real. 
up there by Pine River. Super cool guys. These here will save 25% of your heating bill. You know? So everybody's getting that energy assistance. You know, and the, the energy companies love that. Every year they get a federal allocation where they pay pe poor people's energy bills. So I'm like, why don't we use that money and put solar, right? Pay our own bills. And tribes need to do this. Tribes need to do this themselves and exercise our own jurisdiction over our utilities. But that's our village. That's pretty cool, huh? Like, that's full on painted. You know, so that's, I'm proud of that, you know? This is our water tower. It was all tagged. Annie Humphrey did this painting. That's pretty cool, huh? You know, so what I'm saying is, is that, you know, I want to make things beautiful. Great leader, Sitting Bull, is what he said a long time ago. Let us put our minds together to see what kind of future we can make for our children. You know, that's this opportunity. If you're a student here, use your mind. Anybody else in our society, we got to use our minds because that's where our future is at. So thank you very much for your time. Miigwech. And take about 10 minutes for questions. I know that some of our CLC students may need to pack up and leave, um, so just know that, Winona. Um, but a couple questions from the audience, and we have to do, you're going to have to ask your question into the microphone. We've got this live streaming to our Staples campus and to uh, all of our employees that couldn't be here today. Any questions for Winona? Are there hearings scheduled yet on line three? Can you talk in the mic? Oh, sorry. Thanks. Didn't mean to be bossy. Uh, where we are in the process, from what I could gather in a very confusing process, is, is that they have just undertaken, they're finishing the scoping of the EIS, and then they plan on holding some hearings. But we are hoping, um, you know, the Minnesota Chippewa tribe and the tribes are looking at having our own hearings. And so I know, but Leech Lake, we are going to hold some hearings on abandonment. Um, and start on that, because that really needs to be put to the front of this. And, and then we really need, are going to need to push our county commissioners in each case. Like down here, we're not dealing with abandonment. We're dealing with the new proposed line. But we, they really need to, to clean up their mess first. And there are no formal, there, the formal process, I think, would be expected to be in the spring. But what I'm really hoping is that people will, before that, you know, start getting active. You know, tell county commissioners, move on the Minnesota State Legislature, whoever is in to say, look, we would like some hearings on abandonment. We would like this cleaned up, you know? So, thank you. There was a hand up over here. Uh, I'd like to know um, what, what you might know about uh, any laws that are enforceable uh, regarding the older pipelines and the inspection and uh, continuation of pipelines that have had deteriorated and become uh, dangers to the, the people that are living near them, like so many that have either exploded or whether it's natural gas or oil. Yeah, um, you know, what I have to say is like, do you have one of these pieces of literature? We, so gra pass one of these. We looked and the regulatory, it is really not clear on who has jurisdiction in the abandonment. You know, those pipelines are presently held by Enbridge, and they're doing integrity digs all the time because there's holes all over those lines. You know, and that's what we say is you should, you know, and they've reduced their flow in there. And we're saying you should just cut it off and clean it up, you know. But the liability, it is like in between this thing, in, you know, in between like all of these regulations. And also what you should know is that the Federal Pipeline Regulatory Agency, or they're called FIMSA, um, Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration, they have like 150 inspectors for the whole country. You know what I'm saying? I mean, 70% of all pipeline spills at least are found by you and me. So I'm saying watch your pipelines. Go out there every day. Like I'm, like, I'm just like the rest of you. I don't want to leak. At no point do I want to leak. But that's why I don't want new ones, you know? And I want your old ones cleared up. So please, you know, start raising these questions because this is not like a Republican or a Democrat question. This is like prudent people who live in the North. You know, who's going to pay for that? Who's going to pay for this? You know, Enbridge needs to pay for it. They're making billions, making billions. Yeah, I know this is a different question in a way, but the last numbers I read, France is doing like 85% of their electric on nuclear. And their new nuclear plants let you reprocess the spent fuel and use it again. And yet in this country, I hear nothing about nuclear. 
I think there's one plant down by Tennessee, somewhere in Alabama, that they're building. And that's it as far as I know. They last a long time, and they could be built a little more safely than what we've done in the past. But we wouldn't be killing birds with the wind vanes either. But I just wondered what your feeling was on nuclear. Yeah, okay, so there's two parts to your question. So one is, is I'm, I'm actually opposed to nuclear. And, and one of the main reasons I'm opposed is that I used to work on the Navajo Reservation where a lot of the uranium came from, widespread radioactive contamination, a lot of people died, a lot of birth defects. There's no safe way to mine uranium, and it's super radioactive. And so it's kind of like if the answer is nuclear power, what was the question, right? But if our question is, like, how do we have an energy economy that makes sense, there's a couple things we need to think about. You know, so in the past uh, 50 years, we doubled our population, tripled our water use, and quadrupled our energy use. You understand what I'm saying? So like that, that quadruple thing, that's a problem. And we need to get efficient. So I say get, get more local, get more solar. And then the wind turbine issue, siting is your key. You know, because a lot of those ones were put like the Altamont Pass was put like where all these birds are flying. But you know, a lot of those new turbines, they move like super slow, kind of like a Tai Chi move, you know what I mean? And you know, you know what I'm saying is, is that, you know, and we just need to get her together. So thanks for your question though. Mary's giving me the eye, like quit Winona. Okay, I have like two questions. Um, why don't they, or why didn't they reroute that um, pipeline down through Canada instead of going United States because we aren't it ain't gonna do us any good we aren't getting any of it and does Canada have some kind of authority over the US mm -hmm. and uh, President Obama ha hasn't stated anything protecting the any of the Na Native Americans today so in with this uh, crisis going on for the water and the water thing in Flint Michigan why aren't they doing anything? You know, it's like the white, I don't know, I should, but like Trump's white nationals crap is taking over a lot um, America. That's all I have. Yeah. Um, you know, thanks for your question. I think now we are asking people to, you know, I mean, I have to say call the White House and, you know, send notes to the White House and say, you know, stand up for Standing Rock, you know, um, send out some observers. Um, you know, because what's going on out there is is wrong, right? But the other bigger question I think you're asking is my question, too, is like, you know, we all see those piles of pipes that are sitting here from the sandpiper, right? You guys see them? They're sitting over by Lake George. There's these piles by Hackensack. So I want the pipes gone. And my feeling is they should go to Flint. Like, there are people in this country that want pipes. You know, let's give pipes to places that want pipes, you know? And... You know, I'm am, I am all for, you know, I, I come, my grandma was in the union. I am all for union labor. I just want union labor put to work for people, not for oil companies. You know, so those are like the issues here. Okay. Won't this be going against the original agreement between the Native Americans and the government to protect the Native's land in return to agreeing with what they want us to agree with? to live in their culture? Wouldn't this be going against the original agreement? What they're doing? Yes, yeah. what they're doing in the pipelines. Yeah. What they're doing with, with the pipeline, you know, the, the federal government has a, has a legal obligation to, you know, a trust responsibility, as you know, and also to honor our treaty rights. And this is, you know, these are a violation of that, including out in North Dakota, you know, what is happening. And so, um, you know, the, we need to, you know, continue to push. The, the Mille Lacs ban has really been remarkable in its leadership, you know, politically and in the, le you know, in the legal arena of the protection of treaty rights. And so we're very grateful to the Mille Lacs ban. And, you know, now the other bans are, you know, similarly in the 1855 treaty area, which this cross sex. Um, we need to, you know, those are treaties where agreements between our ancestors and, and your ancestors, you know, and, we, and when we'd like to see them upheld. But we also, and we also want to see work together collectively for, for, you know, fresh, to make sure that our water is protected. You know, like I said when I started, it's a pretty good gig we got here. You can have sugar from a tree, you can drink the water from a lake, and you can, you know, we have a good life. And, you know, I'm a patriot. I'm a patriot, and this is my land. You know, and I want to see it protected. So to me, you know, this is like our, our moment, northern Minnesota. You know, this is our moment to do the right thing. 
you know, for, for our environment. So thank you so much for your question. Thank you all for... heads out, we'd like to just take a moment to say miigwech to Winona, and I thought, you know, what don't you have? I know you have lots of cool <laughs> stuff, and you're going to be heading back out to uh, North Dakota soon. This isn't real warm, but it's a cool CLC hat. <laughs> and, there you go, there you go. Given some of what we're seeing on the news and the spraying of our people and our relatives, I don't know how this opens. But you can take a little bit of Central Lakes College with you to protect so our people. And in closing, we'd like to have everybody stand and we'd like to invite Arlen back up here to do an honor song uh, to say miigwech. Thank you for Winona being here today.